Okay, so yeah, I was uh, suggested to do uh, some reading um, and then the, followed by a little bit of meditation. And I thought, uh, well, first thinking about it, Lung Pa talked this morning over a broad range of Maranasati related contemplations. And as I was thinking about it, I mean, there's a, a lot of different ways that one can approach contemplation of death contemplation of dying, and sometimes with some different aims in mind, kind of two broad aims that I can think of. One would be to develop a sense of of urgency to help dispel our complacency with living life the way we usually do, not thinking too much about the eventual ending of, of this particular life process, body and mind. And oftentimes we just get lost in the world and uh, the world outside and the world inside that we create without much regard to the fact that this process, this body-mind process, m- may stop any any time, any time, really. And we just got a request from somebody who was here this morning to do some chanting for some friends who suddenly passed away in a car accident in L.A. Uh, just the other day. So we don't know the time of death or the circumstances of death for ourselves, but we often go through life not even aware of that possibility. So to develop a sense of urgency that we have this sense of uh, opportunity to to practice Dhamma with a, a body and mind that can understand it and understand the implications and the teachings uh, and not to waste time at all. So contemplation of death is can lead to that if we contemplate the immediacy of the possibility of, of dying. And it goes along with contemplation of uh, impermanence too. So that's one way to use death contemplations. You know, the other kind of major broad goal is to, as Lung Paul was talking quite a bit about this morning, develop that a sense of insight into, say, anicca, dukkha, anatta, uh, the unsatisfactoriness, the transiency and not-self aspect of this body and mind to, to gradually unravel our perception of this is who I am. And then the fear that comes along with that identification when we confronted with its ceasing. So fear of death is often, even though it can be quite hidden, it's often lurking in the background in most of us. And the less we have trained our minds to contemplate it, the more fear, anxiety around uh, death there might be. But uh, to slowly deconstruct this perception of who we think we are, body and mind, so that when we are confronted with its inevitable passing, that it doesn't, it doesn't cause uh, a huge amount of, of difficulty, grief, and, and a challenge. So the reading that thought I would do would be just some excerpts, because it's a fairly long uh, teaching, uh, from Our Real Home, Lung Por Cha, Ajahn Cha's very well-known talk to an elderly uh, lay disciple, who is approaching her death. And so I just have picked out several parts of that. And maybe if you can, if you're you know, reasonably adept at imagining things, to imagine that you are on your deathbed, uh, you don't have much time left to live, and that these words are, are directed to you to contemplate for yourself. And then uh, after I do these readings, uh, we'll just have a period of quiet meditation. And then and I thought maybe I would just take maybe the last 10 minutes or so to offer a very brief excerpt again from some of my own training way back many years ago when I was training for working with people who were dying. And there was a very extensive death contemplation exercise. It was a couple of hours, actually. But just to take the very tail end of that in in an abbreviated form, just to give a sense of what it is for people to use this kind of death contemplation. And then, if you wish, you can take it and practice with it and embellish it and grow it into a a more extensive kind of contemplation on your own. So just to sit quietly now, if you can visualize or imagine yourself, say, lying in bed and having not too many hours or days left in your life, but still enough brain power to to understand what's going on, to put yourself in the position of, of hearing these reflections. Today I have brought nothing material of any substance to offer you. 
only Dhamma, the teachings of the Lord Buddha. Listen well, you should understand that even the Buddha himself, with his great store of accumulated virtue, could not avoid physical death. When he reached old age, he relinquished his body and let go of its heavy burden. Now you too must learn to be satisfied with the many years you've already depended on your body. You should feel that it's enough. You can compare it to household utensils that you've had for a long time. Your cups, saucers, plates, and so on. When you first had them, they were clean and shining. But now after using them for so long, they're starting to wear out. Some are already broken. Some have disappeared, and those that are left are deteriorating. They have no stable form, and it's nature to be like that. Your body is the same way. It's been continually changing right from the day you were born, through childhood and youth, until now it's reached old age. You must accept that. The Buddha said that conditions, sankharas, whether they are internal conditions, bodily conditions, or external conditions, are not self. Their nature is to change. Contemplate this truth until you see it clearly. Even if your house is flooded or burnt to the ground, whatever the danger that threatens it, let it concern only the house. If there's a flood, don't let it flood your mind. If there's a fire, don't let it burn your heart. Let it merely be the house, that which is external to you, that is flooded and burned. Allow the mind to let go of its attachments. The time is ripe. The Buddha said that rich or poor, young or old, human or animal, no being in this world can maintain itself in any one state for long. Everything experiences change and estrangement. This is a fact of life that we can do nothing to remedy. But the Buddha said that what we can do is to contemplate the body and mind so as to see their impersonality, see that neither of them is me or mine. They have a merely provisional reality. It's like this house. It's only nominally yours. You couldn't take it with you anywhere. It's the same with your wealth, your possessions, and your family. They're all yours only in name. They don't really belong to you. They belong to nature. So the Buddha taught us to scan and examine this body from the soles of the feet up to the crown of the head and then back down to the feet again. Just take a look at the body. What sort of things do you see? Is there anything intrinsically clean there? Can you find any abiding essence? This whole body is steadily degenerating, and the Buddha taught to see that it doesn't belong to us. It's natural for the body to be this way, because all conditioned phenomena are subject to change. How else would you have it be? Actually, there's nothing wrong with the way the body is. It's not the body that causes you suffering. It's your wrong thinking. When you see the right wrongly, there's bound to be confusion. So, let go. Put everything down. Everything except the knowing. Don't be fooled if visions or sounds arise in your mind during meditation. Put them all down. Don't take hold of anything at all. Just stay with this non-dual awareness. Don't worry about the past or the future. Just be still, and you will reach the place where there's no advancing, no retreating, and no stopping, where there's nothing to grasp at or cling to. Why? Because there's no self, no me or mine. It's all gone. The Buddha taught us to be emptied of everything in this way not to carry anything with us. To know, and having known, let go. So continuing just to sit quietly. The other day at uh, tea time, we were talking a little bit, I think, on the subject of death, and someone asked Lumpa, is there a bardo? Lumpa's response was, this is a bardo, which was, of course, the perfect answer. Even in the traditional Tibetan terms, everything is one phase of a transition, a bardo. 
even this current life. And uh, also this morning he reflected that uh, death, contemplation of death, death itself is a journey. And reflecting on that myself, I thought, yeah, and, and it's a journey. It's a journey that actually begins as soon as we're born into the womb, as soon as form starts to take place with this consciousness, then it's an inevitable process of decay. Of course, for many years, it's what's growing and increasing exceeds that which is decaying, but there's always some part of the body that's dying. Sometimes the replacement is more than what's dying, but at some point the it reverses, and it's the, the declining part that takes over. But really, it's ever since we're born, it's an ongoing process. Someone once asked Lumpur Sumedho, you know, why do we have to die? And the answer was, because you were born. So just to recognize that constant process of change of not only the body, but of the mind as well. Periods of increase, periods of decline. And I remember when I was... Way, way before I was a monk, in my uh, probably in my mid twenties or so, and taking a rest one afternoon, and and for some reason started thinking about about death. I had already picked up some sort of meditation practice, but was lying there thinking about death, and all of a sudden this huge wave of fear, anxiety came on me, and I was found my heart pounding and felt like maybe I was going to die, and then realized that it was kind of a panic attack that was brought on by contemplating death. And didn't know what to do, except I got up and just kind of instinctively went to the little room I had set aside for meditation and, and sat there thinking, I need to get to the bottom of this. And, you know, the mind was quite jumbled, but just constantly asking myself the question, you know, Where's the fear coming from? What's the fear about? What is the fear of this process that we're calling dying? And a jumble of feelings and emotions coming up. And and finally, kind of coming to another question of like, well, what is death anyway? What is death? And realizing that even five minutes before death, one is still living. And right up until the moment of death, it's not dying, it's living. And that the moment of death is just a moment, that actual moment. And then the words came up in my mind, well, what is death? Death is now. So to take on that reflection of it just being, you know, this is right now, every moment is arising and passing away, right here in this moment, and then the next moment is arising and passing away, so death is every moment. And not to make that just an abstract concept, but to continually come back to that contemplation from Lumpur Cha, from Lumpur Pasano, from all of the teachers, that now is the knowing, being the knowing right now. And then you're with death every moment. And then when the actual last breath of this body takes place, the last thought of this mind takes place, it's another passing of a moment. Everything else is, is conjecture or contemplation or with uh, fear or anxiety or speculation. That's what's happening in that moment. So fast forward to another contemplation that's useful, I think, to see where our attachments lie as we approach, where they might lie as we approach the death of this particular body uh, and of this particular set of mind experiences, the intellect. And as I said, this is kind of like a a tail-end synopsis of uh, a contemplation that I learned a number of years ago in training program. And there was a basically starting with the moment you've been diagnosed with something that doesn't look so good (laughs) in terms of the length of this body's life. And working through over a period of time the, the coming to terms with that and the treatments, and medical medical treatments and approaches and working with people and, and getting the final word that there's no more, nothing more that can be done and uh, letting go of the hope of extending life for an indefinite period of time and moving into more of that 
mode of realizing that, uh, okay, the end is going to be approaching, and then going through that process. And then here, right now, it being the last day of one's life, of your life, this being the last day of your life. And to pick that contemplation up here and to just imagine yourself right now kind of starting to pack it in. The body is very heavy. The body is very tired. It doesn't want to move no matter what volition there might be in the mind. The body just is like too much of a burden, too heavy to do anything. Really can't even lift a finger. Maybe there's some discomfort in various parts of the body, twinges, throbs, intermittent come and go. Not much control over that. Could be that the thinking is starting to get scrambled. It's not, things aren't making a whole lot of sense. There are people milling around who are tending to you, whether they're friends or relatives or hospital workers. You might be in the hospital, you might be at home, but there's people milling around. You can hear things still, but you can't really, all the other sense bases are starting to shut down. You hear people in the corner of the room whispering to each other. Sometimes you can make out what they say, sometimes you can't. Somebody's saying something like, he or she really is getting quiet. Do you think this is the time? You hear people saying that. Maybe somebody, you hear somebody starting to cry. People coming in and out of the room. Sounds rising and passing away. You really can't respond. You have a sense that you want to say something, but there's no energy to speak. Somebody comes up to you and touches you gently, whispers something in your ear. Maybe they say something like, it's okay, you can let go. What does that feel like? More talking, people saying, can't tell if if she's breathing or not. She's still breathing? You hear this, but you don't respond. Somebody else responds with a shh. Let's just be quiet. And there you are, breathing heavily maybe, almost imperceptibly, and the body completely out of control, nothing you can do. Things are confusing, maybe. What is that like? Ask yourself, is there anything anything I'm holding on to? What am I holding on to? What's hard to let go of now? This body, this intellect, the ability to think clearly, is that hard to let go of? People around you, where's the attachment? What's holding back? And then things start to fade. Even the hearing starts to fade out. The world around you, the external world, starts to move into the background, into the mist. And and then you sense a deep heave in the chest. The body takes its last breath. Just to stay with this for the next few minutes until the bell rings. <laughs> 